Well, good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to another day of class. We're in a series called Lessons from the Desert. I told you last week that there would be a test today. So let's see who's prepared. Can anyone remember lesson number one? Greg can? What is it, Greg? Uh, God's plan that uh, you cannot see is better than your plan that you can see. That's right. God's plan you can't see is still better than your plan you can see. Good job. Everybody give it up for Greg. Good job, Greg. <laughs> if we had one of those sticker boards from elementary school, Greg would get the little star by his name today. What about lesson number two? Can anybody remember lesson number two? That's right. Give it up for Margie. There it is. You cannot do God's will your way. Lesson number three. There is no excuse for disobedience, even in the desert. We're in Numbers chapter 15 today. Numbers chapter 15, specifically verses 32 through 36. That's what this whole series is, by the way. Lessons from the desert, if you haven't been here for the past couple weeks. We're walking through these portions in the book of Numbers that are all set in the wilderness. Specifically during that part. All of Numbers is set in the wilderness. But specifically during that part where God is punishing them and they're having to wander for 40 years. Years And so today, we're in Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36. It says there, While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody... Because it was not clear what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord commanded Moses. This is the word of the Lord. I'm confused by the passage today. Were you confused reading it? It's okay if you were. Even the people in the story are confused. No one knows what to do with this man caught gathering sticks. It's the Sabbath. So they know something is a muck. But they can't quite put their finger on it. So they decide to wait until Moses can come and sort this mess up. Surely Moses will know what to do. When Moses arrives, however, all we find is yet another confused person. It's only when God speaks that the answer is clear. The man must die. So why is there so much confusion? That's the question we should be asking. If they already knew all the rules about Sabbath, if they already knew what God expected from them, why didn't they know what to do with this man? Well, some commentators suggest that they're unclear if gathering sticks was really considered a sin or not. Like, was, get, was such a small task, gathering sticks, I mean, come on, is such a small task really count as breaking the Sabbath? Other commentators suggest that it was the punishment that was really unclear. Like, the crime was obvious, the sin was obvious, it but not so the form of discipline they were supposed to take. And then one commentator pointed out the obvious. 
the clue to understanding the confusion is the wilderness setting. It's the setting that they're in, the desert, the place where they're at. That's the clue to understanding why everybody's so confused as to what to do with this man. From this point of view, the desert point of view, he writes, verses 32 through 36 address the question on whether Sabbath observance is tied only to the promised land or is in effect in all places. In other words, could the man be excused for his disobedience just because he was in the desert? It's the same confusion that accompanies diplomatic immunity. In 2011, U.S. diplomat Raymond Davis found himself in the middle of an international pickle. While working for the U.S. government in Pakistan, Davis shot and killed two Pakistani men in, according to Davis, self-defense. The wider Pakistani population wasn't buying it, though. Many of them called for the death penalty. According to their laws, hundreds lined the streets with banners calling for Davis to be hanged for his crime. And Pakistani police did arrest Davis, but the U.S. government stepped in claiming, well, you guessed it, diplomatic immunity. According to the 1961 Vienna Convention, any diplomat in service to their home country is excused from criminal jurisdiction in the receiving state. In other words, Davis could get off on the murder scot-free in Pakistan because he was outside of his homeland working for the U.S., Pakistan, and the United States fought over what to do with Davis for months. It was a confusing case of diplomatic immunity. U.S. diplomats and ancient Israelites aren't the only people who wrestle with it, though. Every now and again, in our faith, in other areas of life, every now and again, we too are often looking for some kind of Immunity. And what better place to claim it? What better place than in the desert? <laughs> Away from our home field advantage, when we're out of our element, when we're going through one of those little rough patches in life. Have you ever been through a valley or a desert or a rough patch in life? We look for immunity in those type of places. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said all those hurtful things to you, but you know, I'm just, I'm so stressed at work these days. Immunity. Immunity. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've been carrying on an emotional affair with that other man, but but you work so much these days, and well, baby, I just, I'm so lonely. Immunity. Immunity. I'm sorry I haven't been to church in a while. I'm just, well, I, you know, I'm just so darn busy. Things are piling up at the office. How about a little immunity, please? That's all I'm asking for, just a little immunity. They were in the desert, after all. I mean, for Pete's sake, we understand a little bit, don't we? They were in the desert. They were the victims. Weren't they due a little bit of forgiveness? Weren't they due a little bit of slack? A little bit of immunity? From all of God's rigorous commands? That's all just a little bit of immunity, God. 
in spite of all that, as much as we want to sympathize with them, God says to Moses, man must die. Lesson number three. There's no excuse for disobedience. Even in the desert. God calls us to obedience in all phases of our life. The good and the bad. In the desert as well as in the promised land. And so, I don't want to beat you down today. I don't... <laughs> I don't want to make you feel worse for trying your best. And so today I want to help all of us. I want to help myself. Our topic today is gearing up for the desert. How do we gear up for it? How do we prepare to obey God even in those deserts of life? How, how can you still remain obedient to Him when you're going through a valley? Three words. Three words. Expect, reject, and correct. I just said that last one a little funny to make it wrong. <laughs> expect, reject, and correct. Number one, expect. Expect that your obedience is going to be challenged, especially in the desert. Expect it. Count on it. Have you ever heard the phrase, kick them while they're down? That's exactly how the devil works. That's exactly how, it, how he works. Where's the one place in Jesus' life that Scripture directly says that Satan confronted him? It was during those 40 days that he wandered around in the wilderness, in the desert, while he was famished, and exhausted at one of his most vulnerable times of life. Satan pounced on Jesus like a roaring lion. We need to expect too then that our obedience is going to be challenged when we're in the desert. The question is why? The question is why? Why does Satan attack us, especially there? In Robert William Service's poem, The Law of the Yukon, the poet writes about the gold rush to one of Canada's most rugged terrains and all the dangers that were lurking there in the Yukon. And I think that his poem helps us answer that question of why Satan attacks us in the desert. Service writes, this is the law of the Yukon. And ever she makes it plain. Sin not your foolish and feeble. Send me your strong and your sane. Strong for the red rage of battle. Sane for I harry them sore. Send me men grit for the combat. Men who are grit to the core. Swift as the panther in triumph. Fierce as the bear in defeat. Sired of a bulldog parent. Steeled in the furnace heat. Send me the best of your breeding. Lend me your chosen one. Them will I take to my bosom. Them will I call my sons. And I wait for the man who will win me. And it will not be won in a day. And it will not be won by weaklings. Subtle. Suave. And mild. But by men with the heart of Vikings. And the simple faith. The child. 
desperate, strong and resistless, unthrottled by fear or defeat. And then he writes, Then will I gild with my treasure. Then will I glut with my meat. There's a clue in there. Why does Satan attack us in the desert? It's because just like in the Yukon, during that gold rush to it, there's gold in them there hills. There's gold to be found in walking through the deserts of life. All throughout the Bible, the wilderness is the place where God brings His people to transform them, to mold and to shape them into His people. That's why Satan tries to attack us, especially there. He knows that for those who can make it out of the desert alive, God will gild with His treasure. In, in the desert, in the desert you're at your most vulnerable, but at the same time, you're on your way to something great. You're on your way somewhere. So expect to be challenged by Satan. He doesn't want you to make it out of it. Expect it, because lesson number three, there is no excuse for disobedience. <coughs> Even in the desert. Number one, expect. Number two, reject. Reject the temptation to justify your disobedience just because you're in the desert. Reject that temptation to justify it. It's awfully tempting, I know it. Your pastor knows it. It's tempting to excuse disobedience when we're going through just a hard, busy time of life. The preaching legend Fred Craddock tells about a time he excused a man for his misdeeds. Craddock and his wife once had a vacation cottage up in the mountains that they used to love to frequent. It was beautiful. It was quiet. It was serene. Well, it was until the man with a fierce German shepherd dog and an arsenal of guns moved in just down the road. Craddock said it ruined their serene mountain setting in their vacation home. Every time you walk by the house on one of their hikes, they used to like to take the dog nearly tore down the fence, barking and growling and jumping, trying to get at them. Every evening as the sun went down, Craddock and his wife loved to sit on the porch and watch the sunset. But when that man moved in, every evening it was interrupted by the boom, boom, boom of the guns. Of the man, Craddock said, I had not met him. I disliked him. I wanted him to move. Well, one evening during a thunderstorm, the telephone line went out. Craddock was forced to walk over to this neighbor's home to use their phone. The wife welcomed him in and held back the dog, the fierce German shepherd, much too loosely, Craddock said. And there on the wall were all the guns, the guns, the guns. And then Craddock says... Through the doorway came the man, the owner of the dog, the shooter of the guns, and he wheeled his chair over to me and said, What do you want? And suddenly, in Craddock's eyes, the dog was not as fierce. And the guns were not as noisy. Craddock says, I reduced his crimes because of the wheelchair to misdemeanors. Right or wrong, we all do it. We excuse people 
and we think of them as victims, we excuse ourselves when we take on that victim mentality. I, I wonder if the man picking up sticks in Numbers 15 was doing it in his own head too. We're not even in the promised land yet. <laughs> we're out here in this hot sun, I don't even know if we're going to make it to the promised land. Starving half to death. It would have been better if we just gone on back to Egypt. At least we had some sort of civilized food there. You know, we're the real victims here. I'm the real victim. <laughs> I'm the victim. Surely. Surely God will understand. But God said to Moses, the man must die. God calls us to obedience in all phases of our life. No matter what we're going through, God calls us to obedience. So reject that temptation. Expect and reject that temptation to justify disobedience because lesson number three, there's no excuse for disobedience. Even in the desert. And number three, correct. Expect, reject, correct. Correct your priorities in life. Correct your priorities in life. I find it in my walk with God that it is much easier to obey God in all of the hard times of life when His kingdom is my undisputed number one priority. If, if God's kingdom is my number one, undisputed, He's number one in my life, then walking through those valleys and those deserts of life, it makes it a little bit easier to obey. Have you all ever heard of the Babylon Bee? You can go to their website, BabylonBee.com. It's a sarcastic website. It's a Christian website with fake news articles. Their website boasts your trusted source for Christian news satire. And that's all it is. It's fake news articles and they're just being a bunch of sarcastic idiots most of the time. But it's really funny. And even though their stories are fake, every now and then one of their articles just, I mean, it hits the nail on the head. One of their articles, I read it several years ago, I've never forgotten it, but, but the title of this article this is funny. You'll like this. The title of the article reads, After 12 years of quarterly church attendance, don't miss that, that's important. After 12 years of quarterly church attendance, parents shocked by daughter's lack of faith. <laughs> shocked by lack of faith. I chuckle every time I read it. The, the, and I worked in youth ministry, so that's a little bit of my background, but I chuckle at it. The fictional parents in the article, quote, are reeling after discovering that after 12 years of steadily taking their daughter Janie to church, every Sunday they didn't have a more pressing sporting commitment, which was at least every three months, she no longer demonstrates the strong quarterly commitment to the faith <laughs> they raised her with now that she is college aged. And the last sentence of the article reads, The family further noted plans to have a chat with the pastor of the church after their younger son Robert's soccer season calms down a bit. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny, but, but I chuckle because at the same time it's not. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. I laugh because... You laugh because it keeps you from crying sometimes, but we all know Christians like this. We, don't, we all know people like this. Following Jesus, church, and their faith, it's a priority. Unless something more important comes along. For many, it's the easiest thing to cancel when the week starts filling up. Why? Why church? This is the only place in your entire life that is dedicated to helping you remember that you're a Christ follower. There's no other place in the world that's created to help you remember that first and foremost, you're a Christian. No other place you go to. So why that? If that's the most important thing in our life, 
Why is that the thing that's always on the back burner? If that's our commitment to all of this, well, no wonder the desert takes so many of us out. You read through the book of Numbers. There are a lot of people that died in that desert. No wonder. Walking through the desert, it's no fun. I get it. it it's hard when life throws us a curveball. It's hard. But if the book of Numbers teaches us anything, it's this. The, the book of Numbers as a whole. If I could sum up the entire book of Numbers in one sentence, I think I'd sum it up this way. If you can't make it through the desert, you're never going to get to the promised land. If you can't make it through the desert, then you're never going to make it to the promised land. And that was Jesus' message too. This isn't just Old Testament. Some people might be tempted to think that, well, that's just Old Testament. That's before grace. That's before Jesus. That doesn't really apply to us anymore. No. That was Jesus' message again and again. Jesus was constantly saying, do you think that this is the most important thing in life? you think these are the most important things? No. Think again. I'm going to flip it on its head. Following me is the most important thing you could ever do with your life. In fact, Jesus said everything else in life is worthless compared to following me. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27. It's one of Jesus' most difficult lessons. I don't know what to do with it most days. Large crowds, Scripture says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, Jesus said, turning to all these people following Him, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Dang. That's hard, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus called James and John to follow Him. And here's what Scripture says. Scripture says, And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Him. When? Not, not in a couple weeks. Not in a few months. Not when I get around to it. Immediately. I always wonder what Zebedee, their father, was thinking, standing in that boat watching their sons walk away. Like, what are you doing? What in the world are you doing? Immediately, they left their father, and they left him standing there in the boat with all these fish and all these nets and all this work to be done. There's work to do there. They had more than enough to keep them busy, right? More than it. They left it all. Following Jesus is the most important thing we could be doing with our life. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus calls a man to follow him, and the man says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. It's not such a bad request, right? I think if somebody told me that, hey, we got this event coming up, can you make it? And they're like, well, I've got a funeral that day. I might say, oh, no, 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 I understand, that's great. Yeah, go, go to that funeral, right? That's what I would want to do. And the man says this, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Golly. This is an Old Testament, archaic, ancient teaching from a hard-nosed God. The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. They're the same person. And I would love to sugarcoat all of this. Like nothing would make me happier than to stand up here and just rub sugar all over passages like this and, and tell you, it's okay, I know you're busy. God will understand. God gets it. No, 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 that's okay. God gets it. I may have even said that to some of you before. And I'd, I'd like to do it during this sermon. But you know, I don't... I just don't think I'd be a very good pastor to you if I did. I wouldn't be worth hiring if, if that's all I did. Y'all could fire me right now if I did that to you. 
There's no excuse for disobedience, even in the desert. God wants followers that make His kingdom their number one undisputed priority. If you can do it, if you can convince yourself of that, well, guess what? It makes the desert a little easier to navigate. <coughs> makes it a little easier. If you can do it, the promised land is just ahead. Expect. Reject. Say it a little funny. Correct. As I mentioned a few weeks ago when we started this whole series over the book of Numbers, remember I asked why the book of Numbers, if you're wondering why we're going through the book of Numbers, it's because we're in the desert right now. Like Trinity right now, our church, probably all of Orange, Pinehurst, West Orange, North Orange, Ridgehead, Southeast Texas, it's kind of like we're all in this desert right now. We've made it out of the storm, we've made it past Egypt, we've made it past that chaotic Waters, the Red Sea for the Israelite harvest for us. And we're on our way somewhere. Right? Like I firmly believe it. We're on our way. This church is on its way to the promised land. But we aren't there yet. We've still got a lot of work to do around here. We got a building to finish. And we got another building to put up. We're out of Sunday school space as it is. But we're on our way, right? That, so I was doing the numbers this past week. It's time for us to send in our annual report for our church and report to the Southern Baptist Convention and tell them who we are and how many we have and all those types of things. So I counted them up. We had 18 people join since this day till now. In one year, we've had 18 people join our church. That's awesome. We're on our way somewhere. But we're not there yet. And we need your help to get there. We need your help to do it. So in the near future, in a few weeks, months perhaps, you're going to be walking along. It'll be the Sabbath and there'll be a stick laying on the ground. It's a good stick. You certainly could use a <coughs> fine stick like that. You know it's the Sabbath, so you know it's against God's laws, but I mean, surely, come on. Come on, God, I'm in the desert here. You'll understand, right? Will you pick it up? Lesson number three, there is no excuse for disobedience. 